Good morning, everybody. It's now 9.30 on the 21st of January. Welcome to the Schools Forum meeting today. Uh, just to give a little bit of uh, meeting etiquette and housekeeping before we get underway. As you know, this meeting is a public meeting, so it's being live streamed as we're having to meet virtually. Uh, so if you could bear in mind to keep your, your video and your microphones on mute, unless you've been asked to speak, that would just help to make sure that we don't have any extraneous background noise. Thank you. I will keep my camera on so that the speakers don't feel that they're just talking to, them to themselves when they're looking at their computers, uh, not through any vanity on my part, I assure you. Um, the meeting this morning, we've got uh, a number of items to, to get through. If at any time you would like to either ask a question or make a comment, could you please indicate in the in the message chat box and I will come to you in turn. And when I do come to you, if you could just indicate your name so that anybody listening in is aware of who it is, who is who is speaking at the time. Thank you. Uh, as ever, I'll, I'll do my usual intro bit to just say that um, as Schools Forum members, we come from all different parts of the education sector in Suffolk, but it's so important like when we were voting at the last meeting, that we remember that we're here collaboratively to do the best we can for all pupils in Suffolk, whatever setting they are in, whatever provision they need. We need to take a collaborative approach to think about all of them. And um, there's a number of items on the agenda today that will re reflect the fact that we might be having a conversation about a, a part of the education sector that we don't work in ourselves, but that we need to understand the impact of finance across the whole education uh, settings in Suffolk so that we can all do our best to support each other and find solutions that help each other work our way through, especially these really difficult times as we're all working through the response to COVID. I'm just going to run through the list of participants that I can see on my screen. And if there's anybody who's joined the meeting that I can't see on this list, please do indicate when I've got to the end. So I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Alison Coleman, Chair of the Forum. Also present uh, members and supporting officers, there are Adrian Orr, Alison Bowman, Alan Cadzow, Amanda Havers, Andrew Berry, Angela Berry, Angela Watley, Christina Lewis, Colin Shaw, David Woodward, Daniel Jones, Gemma Morgan, Jill Mitchell, Julia Upton, Judith Mobbs, Karen Mills, Maria Kemble, Kylie Collins, Councillor Mary Evans, Michael Quinton, Pat Chapman, Ruth Coleman, Sharon Waldron, Sonia Harbin, Steve Lovett and Teresa Spilling. Have I missed anybody? Could you indicate in the chat if I've missed you, please? Lovely, super. So welcome everybody to the meeting. Uh, apologies for absence. We've just had two apologies for absence from Lizzie Murphy and Paul Morton. So moving on to the first paper for the meeting, that's the minutes of our previous meeting on the 26th of November, paper A. I'd like to go through this for matters arising and accuracy at the same time, please. If you uh, want to indicate uh, that you want to speak, uh, just a reminder, if you could just put that in the chat. So page one, page two, page three, page four, and five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 
17, 18, 19, 20, 21. I see that, um, Andrew, you have asked a question about the format and the use of initials. Um, so some members share initials. So we, I will note that and we'll either revert to putting people's names in full or we'll make sure that the initials differentiate people who have got the same uh, first name and surname. And uh, we will put initials in brackets after their names in the who was present part of the uh, beginning of the minutes so that it's easy to reference. Thank you. And I see we have one more apology that has come in. Thank you, Angela, from Sue Prickett. So we'll make note of that for the, for the me minutes for today's meeting as well. Thank you. So if there's, is there anything else on the minutes or is everybody, I will, I will at this point take silence as acceptance. Is there anybody who, who is not happy for us to accept these minutes? Give you a moment. OK, thank you. We'll uh, take those minutes as being an accurate reflection of the last meeting. Thank you very much. So we'll now move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the Schools Block Funding Submission for 2021-22. So I'll hand over to Michael. Thank you. Morning, all. Um, so my son is sitting sitting opposite me at the moment in the second stint of um, home learning. So I'm turning my attention from improper fractions and long division to something a bit more easy and schools funding. So I'm quite thankful of that one. So this is a, a brief uh, paper. It's for information only and it's looking at the schools block funding submission for 21-22. So at the last meeting in November, Forum agreed that Suffolk should continue to follow the national funding formula. So just a bit of background again. So over the past three years, Schools Forum have advocated that Suffolk and its schools should be allocated funding through the funding formula. I think Forum and our schools have seen the advantage of this. It provides consistency and our schools will, will be in a better position when the NFF is finally implemented in full. Um, at the moment, we don't know when that will be. So just a couple of things to highlight on the paper. So if we go down to table one, uh, the total allocation for 21-22 in the schools block is 462.7 million. This is before de-delegation for our LA maintained schools. Just please remember that of the 462.7 million, 20.5 uh, million of that relates to the teacher pension grant and the teacher pension employer contribution grant. So overall on last year, or should I say this financial year, the increase in funding for our schools is 3%. Suffolk pupil numbers have dropped for the first time in a number of years, um, which I'm not sure if we were expecting or not. So overall, we've seen a decrease in the basic ent entitlement of 1.2 million. I think in future years, we should see the pupil numbers starting to increase again. We know we've got um, a few new schools in the pipeline. We've got some new housing developments also in the pipeline as well. So I think growth is something that will need to be looked at and that will possibly be a paper that we'll look to bring to the April or June forum later this year. Uh, the income deprivation affecting children index, as pre previously discussed at the last forum, uh, they've updated the data. So we're using 2019 data in place of the 2015 data. This has actually resulted in over 3,000 pupils being picked up under the various categories. So there will be some fluctuation in individual school budgets, but the overall uh, increase in this area is 1.5 million. The other thing just to highlight is the minimum per pupil funding. Uh, so this is an important uh, factor for, for Suffolk. Because we are a low funded local authority, it means a lot of our schools do not actually reach the threshold as uh, as shown in table two. So we've got quite a number of schools who are actually topped up through the minimum per pupil funding. So we've got 105 schools. It, it ranges between uh, £1,800 to £358,000. So £358,000 seems like quite a lot of money, but that will possibly be one of our larger high schools that doesn't quite reach the key stage three and key stage four um, thresholds. 
So the Annex A uh, below in the in the paper, this just shows what the unit values will be using for 21, 22. So your schools, and if you'd like to share it with your primaries and secondaries as well, they can start to do some early planning on the numbers in the Annex here. We aim to get the toolkits out to LA maintained schools before half term on the 12th of February and academies should receive theirs uh, before the 28th of February. Um, that's all I've got to say on this paper. So if anybody's got any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them now. Thanks very much, Michael. Thank you. Would anybody like to ask any questions or got any comments about the pro forma? As we've discussed before, we did mention it at the last meeting, Suffolk for the last few years has been wishing to mirror what will be the national funding formula factors. So that there shouldn't be any particular contention about this. And I hope everybody is, is happy with what they've seen in this paper, which just summarises how, how it's all come together and what the submission will need to be that Mike will need to put in today or tomorrow, I believe, isn't it, Mike? Today, yes, today, today actually, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I've got history this afternoon and then I'll submit the budgets. Good, good. Yeah. Modern history or ancient history? Uh, it, it's uh, fairly modern history. Uh, it's industrial revolution. So, uh, yeah, something I'm quite good at, actually, rather than uh, improper fractions. Well, give, given our brief chat there and no message, uh, messages have come in, it looks like everybody is uh, happy with this, Mike. So uh, we'll just say forum, um, thank you very much. And thanks to Mike and the team for all the work that goes in behind the scenes to make this all happen. And for all the hard work that will now go into putting all the packs for all the schools together by the 12th of February. Good luck with that. And um, you can hit send on the submission today then. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank okay. you all. Thanks very much. Thank you. So moving on to the next item on the agenda, the, the, I'll hand over to Adrian now to talk about Schools Forum members' terms of office. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Alison. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope it's a bright and sunny morning where you are. Um, I think it might start raining here um, soon. Um, hopefully, colleagues, the paper is fairly straightforward. Um, we need to have um, a term of office for members of forum. There's a bit of a history as to why um, that's not in place. And it goes back to my predecessor, um, Gavin Boltitude, when he was uh, working with you to reorganize forum. And some forum members will remember um, that with the introduction of NFF and the uh, movement forward, there was a sort of expectation that there would come a point where schools forums might not be needed. Um, that's never been further from the truth and the life of a schools forum will continue for many years. Um, so um, ordinarily, the local authority would just decide the term of office, but given that we like to be collaborative with forum members, we've put a proposal um, for a four-year term of office, which um, I'm hoping that people will agree with. Um, the rationale for the four-year term of office is in two parts. One is we did a trawl um, of forum, uh, forums around the country um, and they were broadly between three and four years. Our feeling was that four years brings a degree of continuity. Those folks that have been on forum for some time will know there are things that run over a, over a period of years and forum members develop the expertise so we didn't want to lose that, um, that expertise. So I'll be looking for um, an agreement from you colleagues um, to that four-year term of office. There is a second and slightly more complex um, uh, component to this, which is that um, we have a number of forum members that were appointed long before we were running elections, and we do need to come up with an arrangement for how we manage that and in terms of how those, um, uh, those forum members could uh, stand for election again and the process that we will um, put in place for that. So the second part of the paper is the proposal um, to ask for volunteers for a small um, task and finish groups, small in terms of the time that we'll need, perhaps one or two task and finish meetings to agree a set of arrangements for those um, forum members who, in effect, haven't got a term of office, but we need to ensure that they are, um, that they decide to stand again, the election arrangements for that, or if they choose not to stand again, how we, um, how we put um, appropriate arrangements in place. And part of that um, task and finish group is... Um, we need, in my view, and certainly forums around the country, and some of you will be involved um, you know, through your connectivity with other local authorities, we'll know about um, forums working elsewhere. Um, we're of the view we need a balance between school leaders, sitting leaders, but also governors. 
Um, and, and there's a risk that we end up with a forum that perhaps doesn't reflect the, 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 the whole system. So that task and finish group would have a look at how we might um, manage that. So I will stop there. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions. Um, and Teresa has put a sort of small sort of voting um, element uh, in the chat to see if we've got agreement for the four year term of office. In effect, those people that have been elected, 12 members of the forum, have been through an election process and the four years would kick in from their election date. Um, so questions um, and then we'll go to that uh, that voting. So I'll watch the um, the chat pane there if anyone has got wants any clarification on any of that, any specific question. I'm not seeing things jump in there, so perhaps um, colleagues could use the um, vote to see if we uh, can get agreement on the four-year term of office. Oh, great. I'm seeing some uh, volunteers coming in on the, uh, uh, on, on, on the chat pane. So, yeah, that'd be great, Andrew. It'd be good to have you on that group. Oh, my screen's gone slightly funny as uh, the voting starts. Oh, uh, I've got a strange purple screen that I can't see anything on. Um, Teresa, I'm just going to check in. Um, that, that, yeah, my screen's doing something strange. Alison, yeah, that'd be great to have you on that group too. My response is almost there. I'm getting a sense that people are broadly in agreement um, with the proposal. Yeah, I've got apologies, colleagues. The screen on my computer is doing something slightly, uh, slightly so unusual. There's been 14 responses so far. Here we go. We get uh, one more refresh. So there's been 15 yes and no no's. So, I think um, I think that's pretty well everybody. I yeah, think that's, that yeah. looks like it's unanimous. Colleagues, can I thank you very much for that? And, and can I also thank colleagues that have uh, that have put in the chat pane that they would um, uh, like to be part of the task and finish group? Thank you very much. I think we can take that forward. Uh, we'll, I'll be getting something for a virtual meeting in the diaries. Thank you very much, everybody. Super. Yes, thank you. OK, thank you, Adrian, for that paper. Uh, so we'll now move on to the, the next paper, which is uh, a paper about uh, early years challenges and sufficiency. And so I'll hand over to Christina to present this paper, please. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, this is for your information. I wish to bring this paper today because I wanted people to um, have a real understanding of the challenges that have been faced and are continued to be faced by early years providers um, and to recognise the amazing response that they have given um, in these very challenging times in supporting our youngest children and their families. Um, you will note that I wrote this paper in the Christmas holiday period and since then it's all changed once more. Uh, so I wrote it thinking we were going back to business as usual in January and then we absolutely didn't. So everything that in the paper is in the paper does still stand, but I would say that the challenges are even more acute now um, because many parents, although early years was the sector that was told remain open for everybody, uh, many parents have chosen not to send their children um, because of genuine COVID concerns or because of changes in their working patterns um, and so they don't need the childcare at the moment or they're just not quite sure about sending their child at the moment and they're waiting to see what happens. There's all sorts of reasons why but many of our providers are facing even more acute challenges to remain viable and, and to remain open at the moment. That in effect will have a knock-on for the um, local authority as well because that will mean what we may not be able to meet our sufficiency duty going forward which will then have a knock-on on parents when they can get back to work the childcare may not be there to enable them to do that so it is a whole system issue I believe um, and I just wanted to bring it here today for you to have some understanding what's been going on the support that we've been given to the sector um, and also for you to understand just the phenomenal effort that our early years um, colleagues have been making. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, 
and I also know that um, maybe some of the uh, forum members who are in this sector may want to comment. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, Andrew, I can see you, you have a question. Um, and then after that, um, I'd like to go to uh, Amanda to, to because Amanda has already indicated to me that she would like to provide some more information about the experience of providers. And I know one or two other people are indicating they'd like to um, come back. But perhaps if we could let Amanda uh, give some further um, uh, a further scenario of what it's like in the sector, I think that would be helpful first. And then we'll come to the questions after that, I think, actually. So, Amanda, could I hand over to you next, please? Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm Amanda Havers, um, one of the early years representatives on Forum. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, those involved for putting the early years paper on the agenda today. Um, I'd like to read some comments that I've made um, just so that I keep my mind clear and um, uh, for you all. So operational life for um, early years providers and indeed schools has been extremely challenging um, since last March. And as Schools Forum has a financial role, I'd like to raise a few comments and questions about financial matters relating to the early years sector. Um, but I fully realise that um, Christina and Adrian will not be able to respond to all these points today um, because they haven't had sufficient um, warning. So firstly, in relation to the paper, a few points, um, the reduction or loss of um, fee paying families is significant um, because many settings uh, for them, this money subsidises the government funded places. Um, because the funding formula um, does not pay enough to cover costs. Um, also, providers um, did appreciate the fact that the summer term funding was received, whether they were open or closed. However, um, there's been no compensation or contribution for those who did remain open. Um, we've received no funding at all towards additional costs that were incurred as a result of the pandemic. For example, um, additional cleaning costs or paying for partitioning so that we could operate in bubbles. Um, so one of the things that um, we would like to know is how many settings did remain open in the summer? How many closed temporarily and what were their reasons? And whether settings that stayed open have any can have any financial acknowledgement for those additional costs? Um, Another paragraph talks about um, children who were displaced. Um, we'd like to know how many children were displaced and um, providers were asked to pass money to um, other providers if a child moved from them to somewhere else. Um, so I have a question about whether this occurred or not um, and what where this additional funding for displaced children came from, whether it was out of the early years block, and how much money was supplied to providers for these displaced children, and also how much money was um, uh, given to assist key worker parents with their fees as well, and where that money came from. Um, now, in the autumn term, the government announced that each setting's funding payments would be compared to their autumn 2019 funding levels and that settings would receive a top up if the difference was more than 10%. Um, Suffolk devised an application process for settings to apply for this top up, which was quite complex. Um, and I'm concerned that those who needed it the most may not have applied. Um, so again, I'd like to know how many settings applied and how much money was distributed. Um, Suffolk then subsequently distributed the remaining money um, by doing a calculation comparison and then paid one third of the difference. And my question there is why was only one third paid out? Um, now, it is right that some providers have accessed some of the coronavirus funding streams, such as the job retention scheme, but this has not been easy for providers. And, and I'd like to note that these funding streams have not covered all of the costs involved at all. 
Um, some providers have restricted their offer to parents to make funded entitlements effective, but some have done this to make funded entitlements possible to deliver. It's not necessarily a case of being effective. Um, with increased cleaning and keeping staff static in bubbles, uh, being open for long hours has become much more difficult. Um, now, Christina has highlighted some of the changes in parental circumstances, which will continue to uh, give us challenges in the months ahead. There are also some others. Um, the continuation of additional costs due to the pandemic, such as cleaning. Um, the increased staffing costs due to rises in the national living wage and the national minimum wage, which come in in April, um, which be around 2.2%. And also the announcement of the 2021-22 funding rates, which mean that rates will remain relatively static or just show a very small increase, which will be a maximum of one5 um, please note that these are only the financial challenges. We don't have time to mention all the other challenges relating to the impact of the pandemic on children, families and staff. Providers have um, appreciated the decision to fund children in the spring term that we're now in who are registered during headcount week, regardless of whether they are currently attending or not. And this has definitely sustained some providers for this term, at least. On a, on a positive note, throughout the pandemic, information from Suffolk has been free flowing and the support has been appreciated by providers. The online training offer and virtual contact with uh, County Council staff has been a very positive output. It's more efficient and cost effective for all parties and gives the opportunity for more people to engage and for broader networking. Providers would support this continuing into the future alongside the reinstatement of some face to face opportunities too. The last paragraph on the paper implies that these financial challenges will affect private businesses the most. Um, this is not necessarily the case. Um, it affects all types of providers, from sole trader childminders to large charitable organisations. Um, examples in the last few months of providers closing with financial difficulties include a small committee-run charity and a large community trust, which had a chain of providers. So what can Suffolk County Council do um, to help us? Um, one, ensure that the maximum amount of funding is passed on to providers. Two, um, consider carefully the percentage amount of the termly advance that we receive. Three, consider carefully how any additional funding streams are used and distributed. Four, ensure all funding processes are clear, transparent and as straightforward as possible. Five, lobby the government for funding increases, please. Um, and six, lobby the government for equality. And that's equality with other local authorities, equality with across all types of provision and equality across the whole education sector. Um, early years providers continue to demonstrate their commitment to providing early education in Suffolk. But we can only do this with support from Schools Forum members and from Suffolk County Council. Thank you for listening and thank you, Alison, for smiling at me. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. It was important you had the opportunity to, to put, put all those points across because it's been a really challenging time across the whole education sector, but early years in particular have had some different challenges that other parts of the education sector haven't had. So I think it's really important that they're spelled out fully here at Schools Forum. Uh, the way I'm going to do this now is I'm going to ask whether Christina or Adrian would like to respond to any of the points Amanda made, and then I'll move on to the other people who've either got their hand raised or have put comments in the comments box. So I don't know whether Christina or Adrian have got anything they'd like to say at the moment about any points Amanda raised, please. 
uh, yeah, can I come back in? Um, I can give you full answers, Amanda, to all your queries, um, and I will pull those together for you and get them off to you. Um, off the top of my head, some that I can respond to straight away to give forum the whole forum members some um, more information, is that the money that we used um, in the first lockdown, which was to for the displaced children due to settings closing, uh, we spent roughly, but I'll get you the exact figures, it was roughly £400,000 in that um, in that period. Uh, that did not come from the early years block. Indeed, it did not come from DSG. Um, it came from another funding source. It was funding that Suffolk found to put into the sector to support over and above the normal funding. Um, with the recovery payments, um, yeah, the, the process that we um, used for that, that was agreed with the um, early years consultative forum members. Uh, it was agreed it needed to be robust so that those who really needed it received it. Um, and it was modelled on other um, local authorities processes as well. We were not alone in having that sort of process in place. Um, they, the, the ones who made um, appropriate applications did receive the money. Um, and then the reason why a third of the difference was then distributed was that that was the money that was then left after we'd paid all the claims and then we'd paid all the recovery payment um, applications. What was left was distributed. Suffolk County Council did not keep any money back. All money available has been passed through now to providers from the autumn term funding that we received from the DfE. Um, as for, finally, as for the funding rates for 2021-22, we have the information now from the DfE. We do have a providers consultative forum meeting in the diary for the beginning of February and at that I will be putting forward a proposal for how we use that funding and then once that's agreed with the consultative forum that will be shared with the sector more widely and on the pass-through rate, Suffolk only retains 3.4% of all funding um, and that is likely to decrease further um, next year um, if the consultative forum agree to the proposals that I'm going to put forward. Um, so at the moment we pass through 97.6% of all funding that comes in um, and that is not going to increase, not decrease. Would anyone else like to come in and add Super. to that? Thanks Christina. Uh, I'm now going to turn to Pat Chapman as Pat you are our other early years representative on schools forum so I'll come to you next please. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, I just want to um, say oh, well done to Amanda and wholeheartedly agree with everything she said. I would also like the forum to, to consider the, the differences between the types of settings um, that early years has got with the, and obviously I represent the volunteer voluntary side of um early years and that they, they too have got additional uh, worries whereas many of them share uh, buildings with other people and the problems that arise from that uh, they very reliant on uh, volunteers in particular committees and and having that business head that goes along with things and I know the voluntary sector of the settings are struggling with that side immensely as pe the pressures um, of family life um, you know some of the volunteers are dropping out of committee fundraising is another element it, yeah I wholeheartedly agree we need um, additional funding and things like that but um, vol the voluntary sector is very reliant on fundraising and of course we're not able to do it so that again is another issue that um, and difference between the types of settings that there are that's all really super thank you Pat. <laughs> I'm now going to run through the people in the order that they came into the comments box. So, uh, Andrew Berry, I'll come to you next. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, and thank you, Christina, for bringing it to Schools Forum and Amanda for that um, passioned plea. Uh, my question, I suppose, is in terms of the importance of early years for 
the education sector in Suffolk, we cannot afford to lose provision within Suffolk. So, Christina, do we have a clear picture of the extent to which um, providers are suffering and those that are likely to have to close or reduce uh, their provision? And I suppose the second question is, what can we as Schools Forum do about it? Christina, would you like to respond to that? Thank you. Uh, yes, um, I would say that um, we do have a picture of uh, what is happening in the sector um, and it is becoming increasingly concerning um, and this second um, lockdown or third lockdown that we are now in is having a, a, a significant impact. People who, who were fairly confident they could recover in this term are now finding that because the situation has changed they can't. Um, so that is of concern and as I've already stated I do believe that for the first time ever Suffolk is heading towards a situation where we can't meet our sufficiency duty um, because we we do not have resources available at the moment to be able to um, help these providers in any greater way than we already are um, and so uh, what forum can do is very difficult um, very difficult question to answer. Um, I, I wanted you to be aware of the situation and I'm, I'm looking for any support and ideas that anyone else has really. Uh, we are helping providers to access any information and any funding streams that are outside of our control um, but that does require a lot of effort on the part of providers and quite honestly a lot of them don't have the energy for that at the moment. Thank you. Adrian I saw your hand has gone up as well. Yeah, thanks, Alison. I just wanted to jump in on, you know, Andrew's question. Andrew's point is absolutely right. Uh, the the, the uh, early years is so vital to the whole educational journey that a child will take. Um, and, you know, collectively, we've got to really start to try and think outside the box how we might help the sector. So so what can what can what can forum do? What can forum members do? We're going to have a bit of a discussion uh, point um, later in the agenda, which is around the lobbying that we do, because we all have have influence in in different places we've got um the local authority we've got um mary i know is going to say something about the lobbying that she is doing i think we've got um some some strong representatives from multi-academy trusts who have got a another channel um for lobbying so there is something about the level of um funding in suffolk and something very specifically about the level of funding for early years i think there is some lobbying around additional supports um for um the, the, the early years sector who are in a unique position in terms of the challenges um that they're facing i'm not saying schools and colleges aren't of course they are but i think there are some utterly unique challenges um as, as amanda has quite eloquently eloquently put um, I think the other thing is how the relationships between schools and early years providers, how we are ensuring that communication, that uh, that support that schools can give um, uh, to, to, to their local early years providers in terms of the ongoing relationship that helps um, spread the word of good practice of an early, uh, early, um, early years providers. I think the list could go on. I think we, uh, as Christina said, we would welcome um, any other thoughts there. From the council's position, we absolutely know the vital role that this sector plays. I think the thing that's worrying us the most, and Christina has alluded to it, is in the first lockdown, and Christina will correct me here, out of more than 540, 550 um, providers, there were about 11 that struggle to continue um, and as um, so as a percentage we didn't see the impact huge impact for those 11 providers but in terms of the overarching sufficiency um, people were just about getting through I think the picture is very different in um, yeah very very different in terms of uh, uh, this current um, uh, lockdown and um, you know we're just looking at the ways we can help folks I, th I think Andrew that's probably a really helpful um, helpful idea to think about the wide-ranging things, not just forum, but that the 
how there's some excellent work across primary and secondary about how primary and secondary support each other. We need to think, and I know there's a lot of good work goes on in terms of how the school sector supports early years, but how we can develop that even further. So uh, I'll stop there because I'm conscious of time, but I, I did just want to come in on that point of forum support. Thanks, Adrian. Karen Mills, can I turn to you next to articulate the points that you've put in the message boxes, please? Karen, can you hear me? If you're speaking, you're on mute, Karen. Sorry, I wasn't. Um, yes, I wasn't speaking. Sorry, I was just um, I didn't have if I've got my hand up. I, I really didn't mean to have my hand up. So apologies for that. Not sure what's happened today. Sorry. You might be on mute, Alison. I was on mute that time. Uh, Karen, you put some points in the message boxes and I wondered if you wanted to articulate them. That was my question. Uh, yeah, um, I absolutely did. It was, it was actually around um, the advice that we've been given today around early years funding and the sort of, we've been discussing about early years funding. So it's really just about um, the, the delay that we have had in being notified about it and what we need to be doing and i've heard of the top up funding but to be honest i um that's it we've only just heard from the naht that there's been updated guidance and my concern i'll put my camera on if that kind of helps but it probably won't <laughs> but in terms of uh giving advice to people and i agree with christina this this is a huge issue early is funding and i don't think the information that's come out today is going to allay anybody's fears at the moment in terms of how we're going to make sure these are you know some of our most important children the very youngest children are going to get the education at this moment that they deserve so it's just about concerns around that really Thanks very much, Maria. Uh, Karen, sorry. Uh, Maria, you had also put um, a comment in about the funding. Uh, Christina or Mike, I don't know if either of you have got any information on how quickly the, there'll be some further information about the, this uh, funding information that came out yesterday that will make things clearer or not. Hello. Um, I'm not, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know what being referred to here. I'm not aware that there is any further information about funding that was released yesterday. So someone could help me with that that would be great there was that there is information coming out about the census and how that's going to be done we have issued all the information about the funding for this term um, and the task is currently open and all providers are submitting their claims based on the agreement that we would pay on intended take up not actual take up um, and that is also what I believe the um census is going to be based on. Uh, there is a little bit more information that I've just been sent by Alan this morning that I need to look at when I leave this meeting. Um, and um, there was a refer a reference there to top up funding. I'm not aware that there's any top up funding available for this term. So again, if somebody knows something I don't, I'd, I'd like to receive it. Thank you. While you're there, Christina, before you run yeah. away, um, the, the next question was from Sharon Waldron around do preschools factor into this? Yes, it's all it's early. It's all early years all provision, early. all early years from uh, yeah. individual childminders right through to national chains and um, schools and the maintained nursery school. So I know Ruth is here as well today. Super. Thank you. Karen, I can see you've put your hand up. Would you like to come back? Yeah, we um, we got information this morning, literally this morning, about 20 past nine from the NAHT that actually for census day, the numbers that we are going to put are not intended numbers, they are numbers of children who are here and parents who have indicated that they would want a place but are not taking them up and that there is going to be top up funding and, and that's where it gets very vague. I can't remember all the wording, I apologise for that. It literally has come out this morning just before this meeting. Okay, so I, that, that was, um, you know, it's just, just really bizarre in terms of timing. So apologies for that. But I know in our census, we can only put those children who are physically here and those whose parents um, want the place but have made a decision to keep them um, at home. That's what we've been told. OK, thanks, Karen. Uh, moving on through the, the chat, um, Alison, 
Bowman, I see you made a, a, an important point about the fact that um, work patterns are, are likely to permanently change for some people with a lot more people working from home and how that might impact on uh, their needs around early years provision. So definitely something that we uh, need to be keeping an eye on and that Christina and her team will no doubt be talking to the early years providers about. Uh, we've covered that. Um, Alan Cadzo made the point about the Association of Directors of Children's Services lobbying for a better deal for the EY sector. Um, I know that lobbying has been going on for years and it, it's good, as Adrian mentioned, and we'll come on to on the next agenda item, when we're lobbying, we have to lobby from as many angles as we can to, to just keep reminding central government of the, the pressures there are at grassroots level that, that needs to be addressed. And Andrew, Andrew suggested, do we need a working group? I know, Christina, you already have a group of early years providers that you talk to regularly. Uh, we can talk outside this meeting with, with yourself and Adrian about whether there'd be any benefit to there being a a group from Schools Forum that could help support and input into that conversation if that would be helpful. Okay, so move, oh, lost my screen a moment, just give me a minute. Okay. Okay, there we go. Got everybody back up. Super. So there's the, another question about geography and where the closures have been. Um, no doubt that's all being taken into account. Um, oh, and some other comments that they think that the working group would be helpful. So we'll bear that in mind. Uh, Mike has responded to say there's no further news on funding or increases. It was more about the census yesterday. Thank you for that update. And yeah, that's another comment about census. Thank you. And Sonia's added that um, there'll be support from herself and the finance team and Mike about any additional finance information that will be shared as soon as it becomes available. And uh, Ruth Coleman mentions that there's definitely been a decrease in paying two-year-olds as parents work from home or furlough. Uh, there was only 40% occupancy in their provision in the autumn term. And Alison, yes, we did have a group from Schools Forum a while ago. Yeah, I think we did previously. OK, um, and the geography questions come up again. Christina, I don't know if you just want to come back in finally and just say if there is a, a geographical issue here. Uh, yes, there, there is. There does appear to be a geographical issue. Um, and we have just refreshed our child care sufficiency assessment, which is um, showing the latest data we have. But of course, it changes all the time. But we have to publish that on an annual basis. Um, it's currently going through all the approvals that we need to go through. And then it will be published uh, for everybody to see um, on the website. Uh, we are seeing some pockets where there is um, acute need um, and those tend to be just off the top of my head again uh, it tends to be it's the um, Forest Heath area it's Bury St Edmunds area and it's Lower Stoft those are the three in particular that we are hot spots as it were for us at the moment but I suspect that that's going to um, mitigate out to other areas as well. Thanks Christina thanks for that question Darren. Uh, Alan has added that the NAHT letter refers to guidance that has not been issued yet, so uh, it will be looked at as soon as we receive it's received by the local authority. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, every, everyone would agree with that comment, Sharon, that um, the early years sector is vital as that starting point for all children before they move on in their education journey. So. Uh, we, we're, we're all very appreciative of all the hard work that the early years providers are doing through this difficult time. And thank you, Christina, and your team for all the support that you're trying to give them. So thank you. I'll bring that item to a conclusion now. Thank you all very much. I think that's been a really useful conversation and one that we will need to come back to. And we will review whether there is any value in setting up a separate working group to look at this some more or not. Thank you very much for that as a suggestion. So the next item on the agenda is a discussion item about budget challenges for schools and other education settings as a result of COVID-19. 
So we've put this item on the agenda as an open discussion opportunity for any members of forum to share your experiences, your concerns as the response to COVID continues. And then we'll have a conversation about what that response might look like. I, before I do that, I must just stop myself because I realised having looked at the comments, I hadn't gone to all the hands up. And let me just check. Pat, you had your hand up again. Did you have something else you wanted to come back on? Sorry, I've just realised I missed those. No, I think that's an error, Alison. Oh, Sorry. Okay. No problem. Um, but uh, Councillor Mary Evans, apologies, I hadn't come back to you. So, Mary, I'll let you come in at this point. Sorry, my hand did go up at a down a bit like a glove puppet at one point um so that was my fault now i just wanted to, to round off a little bit from that discussion because as adrian said at the last forum i did undertake to send a letter to our mps on your behalf and i will report on that in the next bit of the discussion i'm really happy to lobby again on your behalf on forums behalf um over early years i think many of you know it's an absolute passion of mine and i recognize as you all do the vital importance of it and the huge efforts by um our providers. It was really great to hear from Amanda and Pat, but also um, Christina and her team. And it's a it's a fragile sector at the moment, and we must do everything to you know to keep it in place and bolster it, and and not um, see providers in such struggling circumstances. So I, I think it'd be great to lobby the MPs, but of course we've also got Vicky Ford as Children's Minister, though not in Suffolk. She's only just over the border in Essex, and um, you know hopefully we can get direct to her to sort of set out. Uh, the stall for Suffolk providers, obviously, but but for the sector as a whole. So thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thanks very much. OK, now we can move on to that budget challenges item. So uh, is there anybody who would like to jump in first and, and talk about their experiences and, and the, the issues that, that you're finding from the response to COVID? Thank you. I'm sure you've all got lots to say about this item, really. Daniel, Daniel Jones, I'll come to you first then. Thank you. Hi there. Yeah, I mean, my concerns are really perhaps longer term in terms of what it means for school funding in the future. Um, obviously, in, in the spending review in um, November or December, Rishi Sunak um, has kind of has seem to row back on on his commitment to um, putting initial starting salaries at £30,000 for new teachers and I, I see why this is necessary because there's a massive deficit but in terms of um, the real terms cuts in in school funding over the last 10 years or so I just I want I, I worry about the squeeze in the future. Thank you Daniel. Uh, the next hand I saw go up was Sharon Waldron. Sharon, I'll come to you next. Thank you. I mean, we're a small one form entry primary school, but by October, we'd spent over £10,000 on uh, COVID related matters. Uh, we're now seeing that escalate, especially when you add in heating because of all windows and doors open. And when the uh, terms of claiming uh, for any any top up funding is, you know, your budget has to be on the breadline and that's only when you're eligible. So we have serious concerns where this is going to leave us as a school going forward. And just like Daniel's just mentioned, we are quite worried about austerity measures that may creep in, particularly as in the 21-22 budget uh, pension costs and contributions, as I understand it, have to come from within your own budget. So I think the long term prognosis for us as a, uh, as schools in Suffolk is, is a challenging one because we've been underfunded for so many years, as people know, we're creeping towards a, a fairer way of funding uh, healthily. Um, but COVID is now going to knock us for six. So I, I'm just quite concerned about everybody's position going forward. But I know I'm a small fish in a big pond and I know other people have even worse impact than me. So uh, just wanted to say it's challenging out here. Thank you, Sharon. Alison Bowman, I'll come to you next. Thank you. Hi. Um, my point was really about lobbying. Um, so I don't know if you want to take that later, Alison, or not. Carry on, Alison. I haven't got any other hands up at the moment, so carry okay. on. Well, as Gemma knows, um, I wrote to our MP, my MP, Dan Poulter, 
say, look, what is happening about Suffolk being so vastly underfunded? This was in the context of the high needs group, but I think it applies across the board. Um, I got a woeful response, which was uh, a platitudinous, the government is doing this, nothing addressing the Suffolk problem at all. Um, I then wrote back to him saying, look, I do understand how the funding works, because I've listed my credentials, so to speak, and have heard nothing since. I have passed this on to Gemma for sharing with the rest of the high needs group. But if that's the level of response, I am very worried. And that's Thank really you. it. Yes. OK, thank you. Daniel, you put your hand up or your hand, your hand is up again. Daniel, would you like to say something else? Sorry, no, I just didn't put my hand down. Apologies for that. OK, no problem. Uh, Mary, I'll come back to you. Thank you. Yes, so as I said earlier, um, I undertook obviously at the last school forum to write about the high needs block and send funding in general to all our MPs. Judith um, gave me a really good uh, sort of draft, which I, I tweaked a bit and um, sent out to the MPs. I spelt it out really, you know, harshly that actually all schools were having to fund that 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 deficit. Um, and, and there has been a really good response. Our two cabinet members have taken it up directly. So, um, Therese Coffey has spoken to Ga um, Gavin Williamson, Matt Hancock has written. Um, Tom Hunt, as a, as a member of the Education Select Committee, has taken it up and he's uh, written to, to um, Gavin Williamson and about the SEND review and wanted to get involved. And not to be outdone, um, uh, Joe Churchill's gone even further and, and setting up a meeting with me and I, I guess Adrian and Alan um, with uh, the schools minister, Nick Gibbs. So that's why I'm really keen that we can also follow up on that um, with the maybe lobbying on behalf of um, the earlier sector because the MPs are aware and they are, um, yes, I see the Dan question. I, there's an email come in this morning from his office, but I haven't opened it yet. So I did send a reminder around to them all that I was talking to you today and this might come up. So um, to be fair to, 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 to um, Dan, I haven't actually opened that email. I, see, I just saw it go past earlier. Um, but those that I've spoken to directly or had direct responses from do take it very seriously and, and uh, you know, are, are putting their weight behind us. So I just wanted you to know that. Thanks very much, Mary. Uh, Sharon, would you like to come in and talk about the comment you've just put up in the message box, please? I was just going to say that I'm, I'm with you, Alison, and anybody else that's campaigning. I am a part of worth less group i'm in their little core group mainly because i've been quite vocal uh we we've taken p petitions we've campaigned as a whole and it's not just stuff that we're campaigning we're campaigning nationally but uh, in that as part of that campaign i have regularly written to uh, Dr. Dan and got little or no response. We've written to the Secretary of State as a, as a worthless group and got little or no response. So I just think we've just got to keep the pressure up. And I'm more than happy to be involved in any uh, campaign group or if I can help in any way and make connections with the worthless group, um, I'm keen to do that because I am very frustrated with how Suffolk has been funded and the impact on our children that that causes. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sharon. Now is a really good opportunity, everybody. If you've got some really nice examples, because it's it's all very well sometimes going in with sort of bold facts and figures, which in, in themselves do tell the story of the fact that Suffolk's very underfun underfunded. But if you've got any, any sort of meat that can be put on the bones that can help Mary when she and others are going and having those conversations, then now is an opportunity to lob it into the conversation here. To, to sort of help give more of that context to help explain the impact that that lower funding cumulatively over time has and what pressures it then puts on running education settings in Suffolk. Thank you. Anybody want to come dive in and make any comment on that? You're all being much more quiet than I thought you were going to be on this item, I have to say. Karen, over to you, please. Thank you. <laughs> okay then um yeah i mean basically it's 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 just abs the the need is rising and the funding is lowering um in terms of specific examples we're we're having to make really quite difficult choices as to what support we can give to individual children and that has an impact with obviously their families because their families as as do settings want to do the very best for every single child but 
the need, and particularly after lockdown, we're seeing um, an increase in potential uh, people requiring um, extra support. And of course, the funding isn't there. Now, to be fair to the government and to councils, we have to be aware that money is tight all round and it's not going to get any more free. Um, so I suspect the reverse. But certainly um, in my school, we are having to make very difficult decisions. And although, you know, my budget at the moment is quite, quite robust, that won't stay forever. Um, and I should imagine in other schools where their budgets aren't like mine, um, some very difficult decisions are having to be made. And that's impacting on individual children. So if a child, for example, cannot access a place in specialist provision because they're all full, um, however, you know, the children with complex needs, I'm sure you have the um, physical in terms of numerical evidence on that. Um, and all the services that feed into that, you will have, I'm sure, more than enough evidence to support the fact that there is huge need out there and that it is increasing. So my, my question, not for Suffolk County Council, but actually for government, is how do you meet an increasing need with a reducing budget? Because Yes, we can work smarter. We all hear that. I get that. But I think schools are at the point after several years of increasing need and reducing budgets. They're getting to the point where the smart argument doesn't work. They're already being very smart. So we're certainly feeling it at, at the actual, if you like, on the cold face. Um, and, and it's not, an, it really isn't. I'm not having a go at Suffolk County Council because this is not your, you know, this is not down to Suffolk County Council as such. It's a bigger argument, really. Thank you very much, Karen. Maria Kemble, I saw your hand is up, so I'd come to you next. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd agree with all of that, but I think if you want specific examples, then the most obvious one is around staffing. Staffing is 85% of most of our school budget. And as a school, over the last five years, um, we have not replaced staff, um, particularly support staff who would be working with the most vulnerable children. Um, so that means in the, you know, having having been in education for as long as I have in the good old days of education, 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 when we had money to have um, support staff in classrooms, regularly working with children generally and additional staff who worked perhaps one to one, long gone are those days, which actually means we're allocating support to those most vulnerable children because actually the school can't function because those are the kinds of children who will have challenging behaviour. Um, but you've then got a whole tranche of children who perhaps bob along kind of a bit under the radar. Their results are not great, um, but actually we can't get to them because we're just dealing with, with the extremes um, that otherwise would mean the classroom wouldn't function at all. I think the other thing that um, as a school we've had to really cut back on is actually staff professional development. And as, as, as you know, in no other organisation would that be appropriate and, and allowed. You know, in the medical profession, doctors have to show each year how they are keeping up with their competencies. And if they don't, then actually their registration is, is, is at risk. In education, actually CPD for our staff is the first thing that goes when budgets are tight. And at the moment, you know, staff go on, on CPD if it's free and if it's not happening during the school day because actually we cannot afford cover um, and we can't afford to pay for, for things. And, you know, those are just two very simple examples. I think the other thing that most heads will talk to you about is actually the state of um, their actual buildings and having to be really, really careful about what you're doing in, in terms of maintenance and repairs and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, at the end of the day, we need we need bodies in front of children in classrooms. So actually, sometimes that does mean, I'm afraid, there's buckets in the corridor. Um, so, you know, there you go. I could rant forever. <laughs> that, thanks, Maria. Th those sorts of real examples are the sorts of things that, that you know, 
that really make the difference between making something feel real and just sort of thinking, well, you know, what difference would a little bit more money make? Well, that's the sort of difference that a bit more money could make. It, it It's fundamental things like that that need addressing that some schools and other education settings in Suffolk just are having to make those decisions about at the moment. So that that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, Coming back, because this item was first put on in relation to the response to COVID, is there anything anybody would like to say about the expense of the response to COVID? For instance, the extra cost of cleaning or the loss of income because you haven't had groups using your facilities, etc. Is there Are there any of those sorts of elements that anybody wants to comment on? And I'll come to you in a minute as well, Alan. I, I, I won't just read your comment out. I'll come to you in a moment if you're available to speak. Was that kind of no, Alison? As nobody else has popped up, but Alan, go for it as your friend. I was just kind of making the, the point, really, that, you know, we've had a decade of austerity and I'm not making a political point. It's just the fact that, you know, there has been a decade of austerity. Uh, so public services right across the board, um, not in great shape to start with them with the pandemic on top. So the point is we've created a, a, a bit of a perfect storm. So families particularly vulnerable families are not in a good position we've had a huge increase in insecure jobs a huge increase in insecure housing um benefits have been cut in real terms and and really quite savagely and um, there's certainly a lot of research that shows that it has particularly had an effect on families uh, particularly on single parents with young children um so having created that perfect storm we have a pandemic on top of it um I think the county council, as I say, I said in my chat, has been very good in um, cutting, take, having to make huge cuts over the past decade, but doing very well in protecting um, children's services and, and adult services. And for that, we have to thank uh, uh, the cabinet and particularly um, Mary and before Mary Gordon Jones in terms of arguing for protected funding for children's services. But that doesn't mean increase; that just means protection from cuts. So. Um, I think we're in a tough space. I think I agree with all Maria's points. I think the problem too is without, so if you can't maintain your building, at some point it falls into huge disrepair and then you have to spend an absolute fortune to um, to fix it properly. So you'll end up with something like building schools for the future at some point. And building schools for the future came out of, frankly, decades of not maintaining school buildings until we had, you know, frankly, appalling school buildings. And I think that might be the way we're, we're heading at the moment. I think we do need to lobby as hard as we possibly can. Uh, you know, it's a cliche to say our children are our future, but that is a fact. Badly educated children with little hope um, are really bad for society in the long, in both, as, in, in the, I would argue, in the short, medium and longer term. Um, so not a lot. So lobbying working really hard, keeping on making the case, keeping on, keeping on, keeping on writing to MPs because, you know, they do pay attention to what comes in the post, post bags, even if they don't always respond to it. Um, so I think that kind of thing is really, really important. And just to, again, say, as I say in my in, in headlines all the time, just how totally impressed I am with the whole sector um, from early years all the way through to uh, further, further and higher education, the response to the pandemic and the putting children first. But, you know, it's a very tough time we're in and I think it will remain really tough for quite some time to come. Great. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for your input there. Uh, and to Julia for, you know, um, reinforcing the the comments about maintenance of buildings and the fact that the loss of income from your lettings has a knock-on effect to that. I think it's useful to, to that's a really useful example of making a link between the impact of COVID and, and the fact that in normal times you're, you're reliant on things like income from lettings that helps you set some money aside to do maintenance of your buildings because you don't have enough money in, in your typical budget to, to set aside for that sort of thing. So that's another really useful example. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for your uh, information about the costs you've spent on, on cleaning and PPA, PPE and supply staff and so on. I'm sure there's many others of you who can echo some of that as well. Thank you. Um, Julie, you've added a comment about technology, and that was something that uh, I was about to sort of prompt some of you about. 
Uh, there's been an awful lot of conversation about access to technology for children while they're home learning. But also, if your budgets are under pressure, are you being able to keep up with replacing technology in, in school in the f with the frequency that you would like to be able to do to keep it all working and up to date and, and given pupils while they are in uh, your setting access to the sorts of equipment they need these days in order to access the, the curriculum. So any other thoughts on that would be useful, I'm sure, to, to Mary. Um, as some others have said, um, Adrian posted a comment about if anybody wants to email Adrian, he can compile some of your examples to help um, Mary with her conversations with uh, politicians, other politicians. So please, if you don't want to do it today, please feel free to email some extra things in. Uh, I see that uh, a number of you are also talking about additional cleaning costs. Um, the, the, the struggle Ruth has put about maintaining nurseries in the early years sector have not been able to access funding for their additional costs at all. Uh, Alison Bowman has mentioned the COVID funding was, um, it's, it's been very difficult because uh, as you've put it, Alison, uh, you've put it as a political sleight of hand it sounded good, but almost unclaimable. And I think if, talking to the head teacher at the school where I'm a governor, uh, his expectation from the announcements that were made early on, once he started reading the guidelines, the two didn't match. So um, that that backs that thought up. Um, Andrew, uh, you've asked the question of you'd like to know who has managed uh, hang, managed to access funding. Has anybody on forum managed to access any of the additional funding so far? Darren, you've put in a comment about the 1.3 million devices are distributed. It simply isn't enough indeed. And the DfE laptops are relatively underpowered and won't very easily go onto school networks when they return. Uh, 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 yes, I'd, I'd heard some other feedback about the fact that the, the laptops weren't all, always um, up to par to be, didn't function very well, if at all, in some cases I'd even heard. Um, Super. OK, marvellous. All these comments coming in. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Maria, I can see your hand is up. Is that a current, a new hand or an old hand? Your hand's gone down. Julia, you've put your hand up. I'll come to you next. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Alison. I think just to, to um, kind of give some meat on the bones to do with the technology, I'm just thinking about the kind of things that we've had to do with regard to technology. So managing um, year groups in bubbles in order to keep them in different zones of the school. We've had to put technology facilities into more places than we would normally have in the school. So an uh, extra cost because of that. Um, we invested that money into that and a lot of those devices have now gone home to support children at home. I don't, you know, we may get back devices from children who've had them at home, but I doubt that very much. So I think the government have got to realise that the costs we're spending in terms of technology is one that's just going to disappear into the ether. Um, but we know that that's an important spend at this moment in time because those children are so without access to education, without that technology in their home. Um, and just a point on the COVID catch up fund, um, I think it probably just relates to secondary, but um, just awareness that the literacy and numeracy catch up fund that we used to get is subsumed into that COVID catch up funding. Um, so that just seems to have disappeared. Um, so the figures stated in terms of COVID catch up funding are actually not as as high as advertised because they've got that literacy and numeracy and I should be very interested to see if when COVID catch-up funding disappears if the literacy and numeracy reappears uh, might just be a way of it disappearing altogether. Great thanks for that input thank you Julia. Um, a few more comments have come into the box. Um, agreement that the laptops that have been provided via DfE have been very basic. Um, Yes, the, the pressure about the lateral flow testing, and this is a further impact on the health and well-being of our teams. This will have a longer term impact on staff retention because that, that will be with us for a long time to come. And I know there's a big program to roll out additional lateral flow testing facilities. Uh, but yes, the, the, the rollout of the vaccine isn't going to be enough on its own. There's going to need to continue to be 
the lateral flow testing and checking people who are asymptomatic to try and dampen down the spread of COVID for, for a long time to come. So, yes, that will also have an impact on staff availability and time for staff to go and have the test done, et cetera, et cetera. So that all needs to be factored in as well. Uh, Jill Mitchell comments that your school received £700 in COVID expenses, but you found it hard to meet the criteria to claim. Uh, Michael has given us some information at 66 schools, approximately 250k on the COVID exceptional costs. There's not been much for Suffolk. Okay, uh, Sharon comments on buying a lot of her own devices because I've only had three from the DfE. And Jill has mentioned that their school got six laptops all out and being used by disadvantaged home learners. And once they're back in school, they'll be used as one-to-one -one devices for SEND intervention programmes. Hopefully they'll come back in a usable state that you'll be able to do that, Jill, fingers crossed. Okay, is there anyone who has any final comments they'd like to make on this item? But as just to reiterate, any other additional examples that you can provide, they're really valuable evidence to build on that lobbying case. So. Please just two or three, even if it's only two or three lines, if you can find a moment just to send an email into Adrian, um, Adrian can collate those and then uh, talk to Mary about those and uh, they can be taken forward uh, as evidence of need in Suffolk for additional funding. Okay, thank you all very much. I'm now going to move on to the DSG recovery plan for Suffolk paper. Uh, Judith, I'll hand over to you, thank you. Hi, Alison, it's Gemma. I think I'm actually going to cover this on behalf of the Inclusion Service. Sorry, Gemma, over to you. No, that's Thank absolutely you. fine. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, I have done a very short um, presentation, which I'm going to attempt to share with you. So if you can just bear with me while I um, see if I can get the technology to work. Hopefully you've all had a chance to see the DSG template. Um, I know there were some problems uploading it onto the um, um, on onto the public site where everybody can access it, but I know that Theresa was offering to send it out to individuals um, if they needed it. Okay, Alison, I'm hoping if you nod at me that that you can see the um, yep, yeah, excellent. I can see you in Could the you corner. So that's take brilliant. Full screen. Yeah, um, I will do you. that straight Thank away. You. Bear with me. I just need to have something else open. So if I do, if I hit present, hopefully that's now on full screen. It is. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Alison. I can only see you, Alison, so I'll be guided by your nods and, <laughs> and thumbs up. OK, so just to recap, um, as you all know, all of you that were here in the November forum, um, forum agreed. Um, we brought the DSG High Needs Block Deficit Recovery. Um, to the group and asked um, the group to agree how we would fund the recovery of the deficit. Forum agreed for the deficit to be recovered over five years. Um, they agreed that the funds would be transferred um, from the school block, which would allow for the recovery and a future demand cushion. And they agreed that 0.5% per year would be transferred from the school's block to the high needs block. This would be agreed for five years. However, this would be reviewed on an annual basis. So following the agreement from schools forum, um, it was for myself and my finance colleagues, so Sonia and Mike, um, to complete the DSG deficit recovery template, which is a document we've shared with the, um, with the other documents for this meeting. Um, so the DFE request is from all local authorities to give detail of how the rec recovery of the overspend uh, within the high needs block will be um, handled. Um, the template is to be shared with schools forum on a termly basis. So it'll be my plan to bring that back to forum every term. Um, and it needs to be signed off by the Section 151 officer um, and the Director for Children and Young People Services. At the moment, we don't have a final submission date for the document, so it's currently a working document. And Michael Quinton and myself are still making amendments to it, um, but we think we're almost there with, with a version that could be submitted if at whatever point the DfE requests it. So what I thought I'd just do this morning, just briefly, is just go through what each of the tabs covers, just so that everybody's aware of what the, what the ask of the document is and what we've tried to achieve with that. 
Um, so you'll see the first tab is the summary tab. Um, this talks about how we manage, how we're managing our pressures on the DSG, um, what our trends are um, for high needs and what, how we're managing those trends and the demands that these create on the high needs block. And then our strategy for ensuring the best outcomes for children and young people. So that's all detailed in the first tab. Uh, the next tab is our stakeholders tab. And this talks about how we engage with our various stakeholders. So this includes schools forum, our educational institutions, parents and carers, children and young people themselves, elected members and our health partners. So that, that that section, we've got the narrative there around how we support all of our and engage with all of our stakeholders. Uh, the LA specific section talks about the specific risks that affect Suffolk County Council um, around their high needs block and the demand for SEND provision. What mitigations we've got in place to deal with those risks. The future commissioning, um, how we're developing our existing services, how we're bringing in new provision, uh, programmes that we and initiatives that we've got set up that support children with SEND and the schools that these children attend, whether they be um, special settings or mainstream settings. And then the strategies and practices that we've got in place, which will support the recovery plan. Our next um, narrative section is about placements. Again, this is broken down into all of the types of placements. So it's mainstream, resource provision or SEND units, maintained special schools or special academies, non-maintained or independent schools, alternative provision or hospital schools, post-16 and health and social care. And for those, each of those types of placement, um, we've given narrative around the key pressures for each of the settings, the current strategy for ma managing the demand at each of those settings, and the um, initiatives we've got across all settings, again, as I've mentioned earlier, um, programmes and initiatives we've got in place that support both the children and the settings that they attend. OK, the other tabs look at the funding and the data. Um, so this is a section that Michael Quinton and myself have worked on together. Um, so what we've put on these sections is what growth we expect within our numbers at all the different various provision types um, and how the funding for that would be um, associated in line with what we brought to, to forum um, around the um, the cushion that we would build in to all of our spend. So each of those tabs, of, as I've listed on that slide, give predicted um, trends and what growth we expect to see um, and the financials and how, how that will be funded from the high needs block. Um, another interesting part of the spreadsheet, which obviously I expect you'll all probably want to go and have a look at if you haven't done already, is the compare slides at the end. Um, so these three slides look at the 2019-20 data and compare Suffolk to the east of England, England and our five closest statistical neighbours. So it's quite interesting to see um, the placements, the number of placements that we have in comparison to, to, to the others um, and also the uh, cost per head of the, um, the two, 2 to 18 population. Um, we talk a lot about the fact that Suffolk is underfunded, um, but you'll see from these that, that from these graphs that um, we do we work so hard to maintain our budgets and and try not to fall into further deficit. And actually, we do maintain um, a lower a lower place funding than um, than England and the east of England. So we are definitely doing the best we can with the funding that we've got. But those compare slides just give you a, a real insight into um, into how we how we how we uh, compare to our um, our statistical um, and physical neighbours. Okay, so that's the the end of my presentation. Um, obviously, I just thought I'd give you an opportunity to ask any questions. I'm going to turn off my sharing my screen because I can't actually see anybody, um, so that I can take questions and and then look at the chat pane. Yeah, no, nothing's come through the chat so far, Gemma, but is there anybody who would like to ask Gemma a question about how the recovery plan has been put together or the progress being made? Or have you had all of the information you need for now? 
I will pause for a moment to give everybody a chance. There we go, Gemma. You've obviously given everybody all the information they need this morning. Thank you very Excellent. much. Excellent. Thank you, Alison. And like I say, we'll be back on a termly basis to give any, any further updates. So thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you. Bye. OK, so uh, moving on to the next item on, on the agenda, that is the forward agenda. Uh, Adrian, did you want to come in on this one? I'll put you on the spot. That's absolutely fine, um, Alison. I was just um, finding my uh, unmute button. I'm hoping I have unmuted. Um, yes, colleagues, we the, the area we wanted to just pick up with you, some of the things that will be on the forward agenda. At the moment, I think we've got two two items, but we'll open it up a little bit wider than that. One of those would obviously be the, the, the termly update that Gemma's just referred to in the activity that she's been describing. Um, the other one is, and I'll ask Sonia to come in on this, um, is a paper on um, CSSB and the working group activity and what that means going forward. I think I'm right in uh, in saying that, Sonia, aren't I? Do you, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. Yeah, I think um, uh, possibly for um, April or more likely June, um, we'd just like to come um, prepare. So although we've already done our savings for 21-22, we know that we're um, the likelihood is another 20% reduction every year. And I just think it'd be really helpful. Um, I'll get in contact with the working group um, who, who already sort of supported our work in this so far and get some um, ideas already so that we are uh, can make the sort of saving suggestions or, or work through how we want to make those savings for 22-23. I think what I would say, and I mentioned this when we did the CSSB paper last time, um, as, as, a, as an authority and as a council, I have got the loss of CSSB as a um, cost pressure to the um, uh, council and particularly our directorate. Um, and in normal years, um, what we would hope if there was enough um, funding, that, that that money could then move to general funding. So and there's still, as I said, because it's on there, I'm, I'm, I'm not giving up hope that some of that money will be able to be found corporately. Um, but I think we have to be prepared as soon as possible for what that would mean um, for the services um, that, we, that the CSSB currently supports. So I will um, bring a paper in April or June about that. Sonia, thanks for that. I think at this stage, um, Alison, they're the key things that we wanted on the forward agenda. Um, I do wonder, because I, from certainly from the local authorities' perspective, the discussion section and element that we had around some of the financial challenges that will inform both our current lobbying and also the uh, activity we're planning when we meet with the schools minister that we put another similar item on just in terms of a catch-up which could be an update on any lobbying from across the sector um, and also um, if we've seen any shift in anything so at the moment that's the forward agenda but we'd open that up if there are items that colleagues think that it would be useful to include and I'll switch my microphone off. Thanks Adrian. Uh, people don't have to think of it now but if there are ever any topics where you think or is this a topic that we ought to discuss at Schools Forum, then please feel free, free to email either myself, Adrian, or Teresa, and, uh, or Sonia, and we can have a conversation about whether that's something that um, you know, we need wider discussion of at Schools Forum. Thank you. So that takes us on just to the dates of future meetings. Our next meeting is due to be on the 15th of April at 9.30. And I'll just give you a moment if anybody's got anything else they feel they need to raise today. Otherwise, I'll say thank you all very much for your time and your contributions to the meeting today and hope you all have a good rest of the week. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Alison. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you.